Welcome to the Navigating Cancer Together podcast. My name is Talea Dendi. I'm an 11-year cancer thriver, cancer doula, and owner of On the Other Side. I use my experience to help others get on the other side of cancer. Gaps between the guidance, emotional support, and education that are needed and what one receives can be huge. This podcast fills those gaps by sharing stories, resources, and information about all things related to cancer and wellness. I interview guests from all walks of life who are living with cancer, caregivers, and those who are thriving on the other side. Also, I talk with organizations, healthcare professionals, and experts in the health and wellness spaces who offer complimentary and integrative care. Join me. We are in this together. Disclaimer, the purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. The podcast is provided on the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. It is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professionals and is not intended for the use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests who speak in a podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Conclusions. Neither Talea Dendi, Navigating Cancer Together, On the Other Side LLC, nor any of its affiliates endorses, supports, or opposes any treatment option or other matter discussed in a podcast. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy on a podcast should not be construed as an endorsement. Hello and welcome to Navigating Cancer Together. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode. I am your host, Talea Dendi. Today, our very special guest is Michael Udwell. Michael has been a serial entrepreneur for his entire life, but in 2017, everything changed the day he found out that he had cancer. After 18 months of battling, four failed chemotherapies, Mike was able to go into remission. During that time, Mike was able to inspire others, coach fellow fighters, and start a company based around his story. His company, Beam, Be Amazing, at You Can Beam, has been able to donate over $400,000, and that number grows every single day. Michael, thank you so much for the wonderful work that you're doing, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everybody. I am so excited to have a conversation with you today about navigating cancer. Thank you, Michael. And I just appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man. Let's just dive right into it, Michael. Four chemotherapies, four failed. Please share with us, first of all, how you learned that you had lymphoma. Great question. So I was 27 years old at the time. And I was working on my first business. I was working in Manhattan at the time. I thought I was the healthiest I've ever been. I had a few symptoms that looking back, it was pretty obvious, but at the time didn't really think anything of it. I went to the doctor for an x-ray after the cough not going away for close to three months. And I thought it was walking pneumonia and it ended up being pneumonia or fluid in my lungs. Uh, an infection in my lungs, but they also found a tumor the size of a grapefruit sitting on my chest. They found a tumor the size of a tennis ball in my shoulder, and they found a tumor wrapped around my esophagus that was constricting my airflow and my ability to eat food normally. Wow. Michael, please tell us more about the chemotherapy. You had to try four different ones. What was the one that finally worked and helped you to go into remission? So the cool thing about my story and the people that are listening to this story right now in regards to being very close to chemotherapy or going into chemotherapy or knowing somebody who's going into chemotherapy is that the treatments that I went through roughly five years ago today are not even the protocol anymore. There's been such advancements in chemotherapy, especially in Hodgkin's lymphoma, that the treatment that saved my life, the treatment that my brand is named after, the acronym of that treatment is B-E-A-M or BEAM. I would not have BEAM today if I got sick. And I think that's a testament of things happening for a reason. And I truly believe that. 
because my entire company, my entire life and my purpose uses the word beam, be amazing into everything I do. And though there probably is a lot less toxic, a lot less traumatic treatment now, I got to go through it and I feel very lucky that it is symbolic of my life. And yes, there could be complications down the road. Yes, there could be something that I would not have to have gone through. But like I said, if things happen for a reason, when I got sick, I always believed this, that I was meant to get sick. I didn't do anything to cause my sickness. And I've been able to use my sickness to better this world and enrich people's lives because of it. That's wonderful, Michael. Thank you so much for sharing that. Can you please share with us some of the side effects that you had from the beam chemotherapy? So the beam chemotherapy is the one that was started with radiation. I did a very rare protocol when it comes to beam and Hodgkin's lymphoma because I did fail for treatments. I ended up switching hospitals to Memorial Sloan Kettering where I got to talk to a radiation oncologist and he was a firm believer in understanding that my case was unique and this is the way to do this. So I started with radiation. And for those who are listening, radiation is a commonly used term, but the way that I looked at it, that it was binary, that you shoot radiation into a cell and it dies. There's no, this doesn't respond, this does respond. It will kill cells that it hits. and we could not figure out how to kill the tumor or get rid of the tumor, however you wanna look at it. And we did radiation first. The side effect of radiation is that it's burning the cell for lack of a better word. So followed by radiation, I went into the beam weekly or a full week of beam chemotherapy. And beam chemotherapy is so toxic that it basically wipes your entire immune system. So let's say, let's use the analogy of a phone If your phone is at 100% and you start beam, you are at 0%. You have no battery left. You're going to have to restart your phone or restart your immune system. I then, after beam at 0% immune system, I had a stem cell transplant of my own cells. And I put my own stem cells into my body and basically think about stem cells as seeds in terms of plants. So you throw the seeds back into the body. I have no plants. I have nothing growing, no immune system. The seeds need to grasp the ground in this analogy and start to grow. And that's how stem cells work for the immune system. And it took about a month and a week for my immune system to get back to a point where I could leave the quote unquote bubble of my room or my hospital room and go into the real world where I then had to be in a bubble of my house and only cook certain foods, low microbial foods for a total of six months before I could enter the workforce. And basically, I was quarantining before quarantining was a thing. I was in face masks before face masks were a thing. So I basically did COVID twice. (laughs) (laughs) I never got COVID during my sickness, which I'm very thankful for. But what I've learned is through a lot of people that I've spoken to in oncologists, that it's actually not as dangerous for cancer patients as you would just connect. So I know your question was, what were my complications? Let's see. I had about... 37 fevers from stem cell transplant to the six weeks or the five and a half weeks that I was in the hospital. The scary thing is a lot of fevers, a lot of complications, but that's my immune system coming back. So that was part of the protocol. I had a lot of pain from the radiation. So if you can think of like a wound, an open wound, if you have an immune system, the wound is constantly repairing itself but when you get a stem cell transplant, it goes on pause. So there's no repairing. So I had internal burns in my body for five weeks of tremendous pain going through that. And this is the craziness of cancer. I had to go on a pain medication that ended up causing a blockage in my entire body where I could not process food, where then I had to go into a liquid diet because I could not process food for a week. That followed by a blood clot when I got home. So I had a huge growth in my neck. I didn't know what it was. I thought the cancer was back. Some people would be scared. I was thankful that it was not cancer. Yes. Followed by a tremendous amount of exhaustion for six months until I was repaired. And then I never got sick at my post-transplant. I 
had a couple little allergies that popped up. So now I'm allergic to almonds. It could have been hormonal. It could have been from the transplant. My doctors don't know. There's some other allergies that I got. But for everybody that's listening, I truly believe, and as I say, all of these quote unquote issues, I feel every normal person would react like, oh my God, that's a lot. Oh my God, that's a lot. I, when I even think about them, I don't even think it was more than like a bruise on my elbow. I just think that, you know what, this is a little speed bump in the process. The cancer was the big picture. And when you're going through something like this as the fighter, I never actually worried that the blood clot was going to be something dangerous or the blockage was going to be dangerous or even the pain. Because the truth is the way that I looked at my battle was I had two options. One option is to give up, which was never going to happen. Or the other option is to fight like the kid that I know I can be and the fighter that I know I could be and truly believe that every single person put in that corner will choose to fight. So knowing that everybody is on the same playing field. And with that mentality, I was able to overlook the minor speed bumps. That's amazing, Michael. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. I always say this, mindset is everything. Did you start with that mindset, Michael? Is that always who you've been? How were you able to get there? So I said something earlier that I was meant to get cancer. And to articulate that even further, I truly believe that my mentality and the way that I was going to respond to my battle was meant to be because I was always a positive person. I always looked at this world in a very positive light. I've had surgeries before. I've had adversity before. I was not unique to that. I was not this perfect life. And then all of a sudden I got cancer. So I was ready to battle pretty much anything. I just didn't know it was going to be this big of a deal, especially in business. There's a lot. And I think that I went into the fight thinking that I didn't want the fight to dictate me or label me. So for the first six months, I was told that I had a 90% chance of going into remission and being cured. So when you hear those odds, why wouldn't you just be extremely positive? Why wouldn't you go into this fight being extremely confident that you could battle this thing? And I went into it thinking, you know what? I don't need to tell anybody and everybody that I'm battling. I'll tell my immediate family. I'll tell my people at work. And that's about it. So I engaged with a lot of people over those six months. I engaged with a lot of people in the business. And when I did announce it, I was overwhelmed with the response of the people in my life. And it was the biggest blessing because it allowed me the opportunity to show people what battling really could be. And from the point I announced my fight, I was put in front of so many people to help battle their fight and coach them through their fight. And they are lifelong friends because of that. That's great, Michael. It's always interesting to see how different people handle th their situation. And the way that you've handled yours is very encouraging and inspiring. The clinical trial that I started was rentuximab and rentuximab with another Hodgkin's lymphoma treatment. So BEAM was protocol. So it would go ABVD, which does not exist anymore because the bleomycin is too toxic on the lungs. Then it went to my two clinical trials. Then at the time it was an ICE platinum based therapy. And my initial therapy ABVD was not platinum based. Platinum is extremely toxic. It was the hardest one that I had to go through. Beam had some toxicity, but Beam was part of the transplant, the stem cell transplant. How did your life changed after treatment? Oh my God. I think my life started to change during treatment because I changed as a human, but it allowed me to do whatever percentage of that life was. Let's say I was living life at a 70% quality and I got to that hundred. I maximized everything that I was experiencing during my battle with post treatment, post cancer. And it allowed me to start my company and it allowed me to start this movement. But more than that, it allowed me to be so much more philanthropic. It allowed me to coach so many more people and really inspire others with my platform. So I still work my butt off all the time, but my priorities in life shifted where making a difference and leaving an impact is the most important part of my life. It's so interesting how everyone comes out of cancer and they may not see it right away, but they come out of cancer with something. 
if they're willing to see it. And it's something about it that makes you just grow as an individual. And I always say that it, it grows you up quickly. It sounds like that was your experience as well. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think perspective is something unfortunate. It comes with traumatic experiences as a human being. It's just human nature. We don't see death on a regular basis. We don't think about death on a regular basis. So we don't really get those little perspectives. But I went from looking way down the road in my life meeting somebody, thinking of that the relationship down the road, business partnerships, ideas, vacations, stuff like that, to really bringing that so much closer to the present, to the fact is, even when we started talking before this podcast, you said, how was your day today? And I remember waking up today and just having so much energy and it is overcast outside today. There's <laughs> nothing truly that exciting other than the fact that it's Friday. And to me, I got to wake up this morning. I've had friends, who've lost their battle. I've had people who have lost their lives and I've had people who are not here today, regardless of whatever the circumstances are. So those loved ones in their lives don't get that. Those people don't get this day. And if you think about that, no matter where you are in your life, you get to wake up today. And today might not be the best day. Tomorrow might be a better day, but you only get today. And I think when you have that mindset, you really get to appreciate the relationships and the experiences and the interactions that you have on a 24 hour by 24 hour basis. I could not agree more, Michael. One thing that I like to ask the men that come on the show is I've noticed that some men struggle with asking for help. Have you found that to be the case for you? And why is that? And have you overcome that? I'm not gonna say <laughs> I've overcome that, definitely. But there was points in my fight where my goal with and I'm very unique. My goal with every interaction in terms of the medical field and, and the nurses are the most incredible human beings. The doctors are incredible human beings. And I always wanted to be the best patient of the day. And for me, and I'll talk about it on a macro perspective, men in general, but for me, I always just didn't want to complain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was having a horrible day, but with my same mindset, somebody was feeling way worse than me. Somebody was battling way worse than me. And I just felt that, you know what, I could suck it up. And I think those words, suck it up, is how men look at their fight. So women are supposed to be emotional, right? And which I'm way more emotional than most people. Men are supposed to bottle up their emotion. Men are supposed to power through things and be the fighter. So if they're in the role of, hey, like I gotta go to him for solutions and this guy's battling, that guy has all the pressure in the world. So I think it comes down to the pressure, whether it's social pressures, or relative pressures that create a dynamic of hiding their pain or hiding their need of help. And I have battled with a lot of people and I can definitely attest to the fact that the men that I've battled with are a little bit more closed off and the women are, I wouldn't say more emotional because I don't really agree with that. They're more open with their emotions and anybody can attack this however they want. I just felt that the more open, the more honest you are with your emotions, the better you could attack whatever adversity is in front of you. Thank you for sharing that, Michael. It's so important. And I just appreciate you going into detail about that because I feel like men deserve the help and support that they need just as well. And if they're not saying that, if society's always assuming that also that they don't need help, they're suffering when they really don't have to. And I just want to get that message out there that it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, you're going to need help at some point in your life and it's okay to ask for help. I always feel like saying to anybody who disagrees with that is what is the worst that's going to happen? You ask for help and someone laughs at you. Where does that happen? You ask for help and someone says no. Where does that happen? So literally play out the hypothetical in your head and say, hey, I'm going to go ask for help. What is the worst thing that can happen? I always think that when you do that, when you actually minimize the worst case, it's only upside. So for anybody who's listening, when it comes to asking for help, People want to help. People are looking for ways to help. And it has nothing to do with gender. It has nothing to do with ego. Just ask, because if you give somebody the opportunity to help that wants to help, it's making their day. So you're being selfless. No matter if it's for you and you think you're being selfish, if I could help somebody that needs help, it will make my day 
So when they say thank you, I say, you don't need to thank me. I should be thanking you. And if you look at help and asking for help and being open for help that way, I think more people would get the help that they deserve. Well said, Michael. What are some ways that you've helped people that are facing cancer? Helped? I more open people's eyes to the <laughs> fact that they can do it. I would say the first person that helped me through my battle gave me the understanding of what I was going to experience. He was somebody I could relate to because when I said I was having a bad day, he understood. And I think that's the most valuable thing in a fight is to be able to say you're having a bad day and the other person receiving that information gets it. And when you feel that, it really means a lot because your loved ones aren't battling with you or don't know what that feels like. So I think that was something that I've uh, given to all the people who I fought with. I think that showing them how I fought and how positive I was through my fight gave them inspiration. And then a platform for answers when they had questions. I think when someone was just like, what did you do when you felt bad? What did you do when you weren't hungry? What did you do for X, Y, and Z? And I was there to say, hey, I don't know if this is gonna work for you, but this is what I did. And that relatability, that comfort, and that security that I provided, I think helped or assisted people with their battle. That's so true, Michael, because that was one thing that I did not have on my cancer journey. And I look back now and it would have made a world of difference. And that's part of the reason why I want to talk to people like you. I want to do this podcast so that if there's people out there that don't have a specific person that they can go to, they can listen to you. They can listen to other episodes of this podcast and get some of those questions answered. I appreciate, Michael, all the people that you show up for. It's so important. It's actually my pleasure. So I thank you for thanking me. But the truth is that I really want to make that a resource. That would be my end goal is to almost have a big brother, big sister connection to, to oncology where no matter what, every cancer patient will have a phone number to call that somebody who recently battled within a six or 12 month period that is either good or not good. It's up to them to then say, hey, like you're going to be OK, because the one thing I always say is the doctor never went through chemo. Your mom or your dad or your significant other never went through chemo. So when they say like, it's going to be okay, it's going to be all right, it goes into one ear and out the other. You're a fighter. But when someone who battles is just, hey, you're going to have two bad days. You're going to have your chemo, you're going to have your steroids. And then when that steroid wears off, you're going to have two bad days. But then you're going to get 5% of your life back, 5% of your energy back. Then you're going to get 10% of your energy back. And you're going to hold on to that 5 and 10%. And you're going to grasp onto that. Whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, this is your life. You only have so much life to live. You're going to grab onto that. When somebody who went through it went, told me that, I literally woke up that morning. I felt a little bit better. I attacked the day. And when my body told me to quit, I went back to bed and rested. So I agree with you 100%. Words matter. Words are so important because the things that you say, your cells hear those things. The yep. things that you feel, your cells feel those things. And we want to create an environment where our cells can thrive. Yep. I completely agree. And I think attitude is everything. And I think that the people who fight with the attitude and the aggressive, a positive aggression really attack the fight in a different way. I wouldn't say it necessarily affects the odds or whatnot, but it gives you a better fight. And if a better fight is what ends up helping you get through it, then it's worth everything. So that's why I do truly believe in the attitude is everything. Michael, based on your experience on your cancer journey, you've spent a lot of time in the hospital and in the healthcare system. Based on your experience, what advice do you have for doctors and other healthcare professionals who treat cancer patients? To understand that they've never been through it. So <laughs> I had some of the best doctors, even at Mount Sinai, I still talk to the doctor, my, my initial hospital, the nurses, I still will never forget the initial nurses. I think the nurses get unrecognized or they don't get remembered for the right reasons because without the nurses in my life, without their comfort, because they got to see it on a day-to-day -day basis, it really made a difference. So for doctors listening, understand that the nurses are so much closer to the battle than they are. And I don't know if that's based on oncology, the training, because it's a very emotional or emotionless fight for the doctors and I get why. 
but it's okay to have emotion. Even if you have to fake it for the patient, it's worth everything. So I think that understanding that you've never been through it and the way that you verbalize how chemo is going to be, the nurses were so much better at articulating it because they were there, they got to see it and they didn't sugarcoat it. And I think that sugarcoating only hurts everybody involved. So we're fighters. Yes, it's scary, but at the end of the day, by you not telling us the truth, I felt was a hindrance on our attitude because when I get blindsided, when you said, oh, it shouldn't be that bad, and then it is that bad, I'm way worse off. When I'm anticipating it, and yes, it's a ticking time bomb, and I'm anticipating it, and it could hurt that, and that's your mentality, but the truth is, a ticking time bomb is better than not being aware of the bomb that goes off, in my opinion. I agree with everything you've said, Michael, because at least if you're aware of it, you can start to mentally prepare in some way. But if it's just boom, you're like, where did this come from and what's happening? And you're already dealing with all these other things. But if they can lead up to, hey, this may happen, you can start to get yourself together and anticipate that and somewhat prepare for that. To your point about the nurses, oh man, I still remember my oncology nurse. I had two of them. They were amazing. Incredible. I hugged them so tight when I finished chemo because like you said, they're right there with you. They see the good, the bad, the ugly. They see it all. 100%. Michael, I want to shift a little bit to all of the wonderful work that you're doing. You have donated over $400,000. I just want to commend you for that. I would like to know what foundations you have donated to, Michael, and why did you choose those foundations? Okay, so the first one where I would say the bulk share of my donations go to is Memorial Sloan Kettering Cycle for Survival, and that's 100% of proceeds go to Cycle for Survival. It is a bike race in the Northeast area, or now it's, I guess, not international. It's across the United States now. But at the time, I believe it was just the Northeast. And the truth behind why it was that place, I wasn't at Memorial Sloan Kettering at the time. My friend signed me up for the bike race, the fundraiser, when I got sick. But I didn't tell people about my fight. And when the six months came up and I failed the first chemo, The good news from them was, hey, I don't know if you're interested in this, but we did sign you up for that bike race. And the timing couldn't have been more perfect. Another reason why I believe that everything happens for a reason, where I announced my fight on social media to the public that I was battling, that my buzz haircut was not on purpose, or it was on purpose, sorry. And it was because I was battling. And within 12 minutes, I raised $25,000. I received... 500 likes and comments on Facebook and Instagram. I received hundreds of text messages of people saying, oh my God, I met you the other week. I had no idea. You were such an inspiration. I donated. And this was the first time in my life where I got to experience what an impact felt like, where I was ultimately selfless about my fight. And the most selfish thing was I got more reward from donating and this incredible philanthropy than anything I've ever done in my life. So it was a very paradoxical experience. That was the start. Each and every year I added to my team, whether it was people who were battling, whether it was the platforms through my businesses. The coolest thing is with my new company, Beam, I was able to use that platform to amplify my cycle for survival, where we were able in one year to raise over a quarter of a million dollars, which was To this day, one of my most proud accomplishments. My company's DNA is philanthropic, so it's not just necessarily cancer research. My platform of being be amazing or you can beam is just giving back to this world. Whether on Earth Day we plant trees and we've planted over 1,000 or 2,000 trees since we started the company. In December, we like to donate to underprivileged children through Salvation Army and Toys for Tots. Two months ago, we donated thousands of hours of therapy for people who are bad in mental health, mental issues through BetterHelp. This week and this month, because it is my five-year cancer anniversary from the when I found out that I had cancer, we are donating to the Lymphoma and Leukemia Society. And the list goes on. The one thing I can say is that momentum generates itself and the world is going to give you opportunities to make this place a better world. 
I open my arms, I open my eyes to try to help make this world better. And the world responded. That is amazing, Michael. Thank you so much for sharing that. You are doing some great work. And I have to say congratulations on your upcoming five years. That is so amazing. It's a blessing. I know when you hit that five year mark, it's yeah. <laughs> It's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. And people that haven't been through it, they may not get it. But that's when they say you could start to feel more comfortable that, hey, it may not come back. So when you hit that five year mark, it's a celebration. Even if you're not really celebrating, it's a celebration. Yes, yes. Yeah. It is a it's an ongoing celebration of life, but it gets amplified on those days. Yes, yeah, so true. Michael, I want you to tell us more about Beam. What are the products and or services that Beam offers? Beam is a premium supplement company of the highest quality. So when you think of supplements, it's specifically it's greens for immunity. It's vegan protein for meal replacement and muscle re muscle recovery. There's energy supplements to go to the gym and recovery supplements in general. The inspiration behind the product lineup was from my experience when I was battling. When I was sick, I tried to keep my immune system as high as possible. So I was drinking green supplements and supplements are not needed. I want to firmly state that supplements are supplemental to your diet, but when you're battling, you really don't have an appetite. So liquid is very important because if I could drink my calories and I drink my nutrients, it was really important to me. So I was having plant-based proteins because that's what my doctor was telling me to do. To be honest, they were the most disgusting tasting things I've ever had. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think they were very good for me. So I decided when I was healthy, I was going to fix that issue. So we came out with an incredible formula for our super greens that's all natural and it was led with broccoli and kale and superfoods. It's a great immune booster that I can have and I continue to have every single day. Our vegan protein comes in incredible flavors like cinnamon cereal or cinnamon toast crunch, birthday cake, chocolate brownie, vanilla cream, and the list goes on and on, blueberry muffin. And the truth is that not only are they of the highest quality and the highest standards, they taste great, so you have them every day. Mm -hmm. I always said you can have the best formula in the world <laughs> and you can taste it once and spit it out and it's only for one day. Or you could have a good formula to great formula and have it 30 straight days and the benefits are immensely better. So that is the inspiration behind our brand is the customer experience, providing the highest quality supplements and just really creating good benefits, good habits for long lasting impact. Michael, are these products for anyone? Do they have to be someone going through cancer or focused on working out? Is it just for anyone? So our brand is ultimately the most inclusive brand in the industry. So we truly believe that any man or woman of any age can take our products and be very, very confident how safe they are. We fully disclose everything. Uh, we show everything. We third party test. So whether you're in it for meal replacement, whether it's smoothies, whether it's for working out, if you're battling cancer, anybody could take beam supplements. And I think that is the most exciting thing because I'm not just creating a supplement company. I'm creating a brand and I'm creating a movement that ultimately will leave a legacy that's way bigger than myself, which is all I care about in life. That's wonderful. Thank you, Michael, for sharing that. Before we wrap up, I like to ask my guests these two questions. The first one is, what is something that you've learned in life that you'd like to share with the listeners? My favorite quote, and I truly believe this, is life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you. And that's why I'm the biggest believer that this is my path, this is my journey, and I am going to optimize it and maximize it so that I can make the biggest impact. Great advice. Michael, what is next for you and Beam? Oh my God, that is the most <laughs> exciting part. I am doing my ultimate best to grow this brand because with the growth of this brand increases our impact. So in the past two days, we've raised a few thousand dollars for lymphoma and leukemia. But in five years from now, if we're 10 times our size, imagine our impact. And just that thought of knowing that whatever I'm doing now gets amplified the bigger we get, is the most exciting thing for building a brand and building it with my incredible team and what we've been able to accomplish. 
That's great work. I love the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. They do great work. They have some amazing educational programs. That's a great organization to partner with and support. You want to know the craziest thing and another confirmation that things happen for a reason. So I'm going through all the different lymphoma and leukemia societies and and foundations. And I picked this one, which is the one that you're speaking of. And it's based out of my hometown, which is a very small town in Westchester, New York. And I was just like, this is meant to be. I was just like, once I saw like the headquarters was Rybrook, New York, I was just like, (laughs) nobody knows where Rybrook, New York is. And like, it's a very small town. Exactly. And I, I was just blown away. I was just like, I have to do this foundation. And I'm so excited because of it. That's so cool. I'm just so grateful for you, Michael, because so many people need these resources. They need that financial support. And you and your company just being able to help those organizations provide for people who are going through some of the toughest times in their lives, it makes a world of difference. Right back at you and everything that you're doing with your platform and your messaging is so helpful for so many. And I consider myself lucky to now have you in my life and listening to your podcast because you are affecting and creating such a positive impact as well. So we're in this together. I feel like you're in a special club once you get sick and once you get the C word and (laughs) it's a bond that is so powerful. So with that bond, with that power and that responsibility, the fact that you're making an impact is pretty incredible. Thank you so much, Michael. And I am honored to know you and share this space with you. You are amazing. I love your spirit and everything. (laughs) So Michael, if other people want to get in touch with you, they want to learn more about the work that you're doing, they want to help out, or they want to learn more about Beam, where can they find you? So personally, my Instagram is just my last name. It's at Udell, Y-E-W-D-E-L-L. And my brand, my business is you can beam.com or all of our uh, social media handles is at you can beam. And you could always just email me if you ever want to get in touch. If you ever want to talk to me, you can DM me, message me, email me at mike at you can beam.com. And you can provide all of that information in the links if possible or the mm-hmm. description because I am always open to helping others and I'm always opening to hear other people's stories. So great. Yeah. I will definitely include that information in the listen notes for anyone interested. You can access those links and get in touch with Michael. And again, Michael, I just want to thank you so much for joining us, for sharing your warmth and your love. I feel it. I hope the audience does too. I just appreciate your time. I had a blast today and thank you so much for having me on the podcast today. My pleasure. Before we end today, I'd like to give a shout out to the listeners. Thank you so much for joining us. That is it for this Wednesday. Until next time, let's keep navigating cancer together. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of Navigating Cancer Together. I hope you enjoyed it. Please be sure to subscribe. And if you enjoyed the show, please share or tell your friends and family about it. For notes from the show and previous episodes, visit ontheotherside.life and check out the podcast section. I would love it if you joined us for the next episode. Talk to you soon.